Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to the last session. <laughs> I'm so impressed you made it. Thank you. I didn't think I'd have anybody in the room, so I'm very delighted to see you here. My name is Abby Rincon. I'm from UC Berkeley School of Public Health. I'm the Director of Diversity, and I'm excited to talk about what is public health, and I have a lot of slides to share with you about my experiences in public health, and um, at the end, we're going to talk about what it takes to get into a school like UC Berkeley School of Public Health. So thank you for your attention, and um, I'm very impressed that you're still here at this great conference and the last day and the last hour. So you guys obviously are serious people. Very impressed. All right. So in the work that I do at UC Berkeley, I work with a lot of undergraduates, and I work with undergraduates all over the state. In a lot of the work, I'm doing outreach. I'm traveling. I'm traveling to UC Riverside. I'm traveling to UC Irvine. I'm traveling to community colleges. I'm going to CSU San Bernardino. I'm doing a lot of traveling and outreach. And I often, when I ask people, well, so what do you see yourself doing in your future? And this is what I hear. I want to be a doctor so I can help my community. Or I want to make a difference to help people to be healthy, which I think is fabulous. And so I'm excited when they tell me those things because I'm like, thank you. We need you. We need you to be doing this work. Now, a lot of them say to me, I want to be a doctor, and they say that because of shows like this. And I'm not saying that's the only reason. But we have very popular shows in our pop culture that depict medicine and how exciting it is and how fun it is. I mean, Grey's Anatomy, how fun is that, right? There's all this drama, relationships, people are having babies, getting divorced, they're getting, falling in love again. And then we've got this guy who's a, a maniac genius. And you want to be like him. You want to be able to figure out those odd diseases and be the one who's just on the cutting edge. So we know about that. We know about medicine. So I want to help my community be healthy. We think the only way to do that is to become a doctor. So what's the best kept secret? It's not medicine. It's not nursing. What is it? Yay, it's public health. So it is for people who do want to help, do want to improve the health of their community, and for people who want a noble health career, and to know that it's in demand. So it's a standalone career. You can definitely add it as a complement to medicine or something else, but it's definitely a standalone career. Now, just to wrap our brains a little bit around what public health is, I'm sharing with you what are some top public health achievements. So one of them is vaccinations. How many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you have had a vaccination in your life at some point? Awesome. So most, mostly everybody here. And the reason why we have vaccinations is so that we can prevent us from getting sick, right? And there was a time when vaccinations didn't exist, so people would get these illnesses and they would actually die. So vaccinations are a major public health achievement so that we prevent the, us from getting sick in the first place. Also, also motor vehicle safety. There was also a time when you didn't need to wear a seatbelt. You didn't need to have a helmet. So now, now with the laws passed, people are surviving uh, car crashes at better rates, higher rates, and actually there's fewer accidents, uh, deaths as a result of the accidents. Safer and healthier foods. Right now there's a lot of attention around foster farms chickens. Right? Hopefully nobody's had any of that in the last week. But because of public health and the attention that public health has to making sure we eat healthier foods, that we know when there is an outbreak like salmonella, that the chickens are recalled, the plants are monitored. There's a lot of attention to this. So a lot of work has been happening to make sure that our foods are healthier. Also, recognition of tobacco use as a health hazard. There was also a time when smoking was considered very glamorous. It was considered sexy. It was considered something if you wanted to be beautiful, be with the in people, you smoked. So a lot of the films that we saw back, you guys weren't even alive then, but in the 60s, the 50s, some, in, some even now, the really cool people and the beautiful people smoke. So a lot of that is very influential for young people, especially kids, because they want to be like that. So they want to adopt those behaviors. Well, public health has done a lot of awareness campaigns that focuses on the health hazards of smoking and has added, been working with the state government and the legislature to put tobacco tax on cigarettes. So that tobacco tax has been used as 
educational campaigns against smoking. So some of you have probably seen commercials and ads and things like that. They've actually proven that they've made a difference in smoking rates going down in California. That's public health. That's a major public health achievement. And the last one I'm going to highlight, there's a lot more than what I'm sharing with you, but in the interest of time, I just shared this, that we have safer workplaces. So ensuring that workers in occupational safety have insurances that they're going to have a, a good work environment, that they're going to have certain regulations that you know, prevents them from getting hurt or injured. So there are a lot of onus is on the employer to ensure worker safety, but that is public health. So there's a lot of things that we can think of, even things like, you know, right now we have bottled water, but for the most part we can go out to a water faucet, we can go home, we can turn on our faucet, we can drink a glass of water. That is public health. That's making sure that we can all live healthy, we can access good and healthy water. Of course, that's not everywhere, right? There are places in California that there, are, there is not healthy water, but for the most part, we have it. So here's some, just some background information about the public health job market. The Association of Schools of Public Health and Programs estimates that by the year 2020, there will be 250,000 public health job openings. So that's not that far from now. It's also considered a profession that is recession resistant. So when we had an economic downturn a few years ago, a lot of people lost their jobs, a lot of people were on an unemployment, public health stayed steady. So they call it recession resistant. So you can have pretty good comfort in knowing you'll have job security if you have a master's in public health or even a doctorate in public health. And at Berkeley right now, we have over 190 jobs listed on our website alone, just for our school, for public health jobs. We don't have enough students to fulfill those jobs. So if you want job security, no matter where you live, no matter where you go, public health would be a, a career for you. So I'm going to share with you now an example of a, an experience that I had in my professional public health experience that highlights some of the difference about what public health is. So not too far from here in Northern California, I used to work in a small agricultural community in a town called Gridley. Anybody here at Gridley before? Small, 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 small town. But the town is very known for um, its peaches and its kiwis. And so they have a lot of farm workers that, that work there. And I worked in the clinic that was right adjacent to the, one of the largest peach, peach orchards. And in, in this clinic, we had this huge gravel lot, and we had a trailer. And in that trailer was the clinic where I used to work. So I was hired for two roles. I was, it was one full-time job, but it was two roles. One was as, my, as a nurse because I started off as a nurse. I wanted to work as a nurse. I thought I wanted to go on to become a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. But I started off as a nurse, so I had my nursing license. But the other part of my job was to be, they hired me as a health educator. So that's what I did. I did both of those jobs at this one clinic in this small town up in Northern California. So this one night, I'm working as a nurse and I'm triaging patients. And when you triage patients, that means they come in and you have to take their vital signs, their blood pressure, their respirations, their pulse, and you ask the patients, why are you here tonight? Why do you want to see the doctor? And the clinic shift was like 5 to 9 o'clock. So that's what I was doing. And this particular night, some of the men were coming in and they were telling me that they had this really awful rash and they showed it to me. They had like, like bumps, raised bumps. It was on their arms and it was on their neck and a little bit here on their abdominal uh, side. They had a lot of itchiness, really severe headache, really, se I mean, just pounding headaches. They complained of nausea, dizziness, and shortness of breath. So the first man did all that, wrote it on his chart, put his chart on the door for the doctor. Second man came in, same thing. Third man, same thing. All the way up to about 10 men, the same, same complaints of illnesses, of, of how they were feeling. So was doing my job, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is not looking good, so what is going to be the diagnosis of these men? I was just like, okay, there's something going on. I'm not a doctor, but I think there's something pretty serious going on here. Well, guess what? The doctor, when he finishes with a patient, he writes in the chart the diagnosis and the treatment, and he hands the chart back to me. So 
Every single one of these patients had this. They were diagnosed with nervios, and that's exactly how the doctor wrote it in the chart. And nervios means anxiety, and they were all given a prescription for Valium. Now, how many of you, raise your hand if you think that was an accurate diagnosis and the best treatment. Raise your hand. Nobody. Okay. I was the same as you. I didn't think that was, that was right. So that night, we're cleaning up the clinic. It's about 9.30 at night. I approached the physician, and I asked him, how, how is this possible that severe headache, shortness of breath, itchiness, rash, is anxiety, and you're giving them Valium? And of course, he was just blew up at me, was completely outraged that how dare I question the doctor. So that conversation went nowhere. But I left the clinic that night really upset. I myself was outraged, and I couldn't sleep. Because I knew that wasn't right. I knew those men didn't have anxiety. Maybe they did as a result of their symptoms, but that wasn't the presenting problem. So now my health educator, public health hat, did this. I, I, I come from a family of farm workers. My, my family were migrant farm workers. I myself did not do the work, but I grew up knowing about it. I grew up knowing the stories. And I knew enough that you know, I have stories from my aunts and my father telling me that they were working and the planes would go over and it would rain on them, chemical, the pesticides. So I knew that was pesticides. I knew that was pesticides. So I decided to do something. And I ended up organizing countywide conferences in, in conjunction with the county health departments, with agencies, with the hospitals, to put together informational conferences for clinical providers, for farm owners, and also for farm workers. And it was, it was crazy thinking to me that how could a physician who works in an agricultural community where the number one industry is agriculture, the number one job are farm workers, not know what pesticide poisoning is? How do you do that? How do you do that? So I came to realize, because I started doing my own investigation, I started calling the State Department, I found out that by law, if you have a suspected pesticide poisoning, suspected, not confirmed, suspected case as a clinician, you have to report it. That's a law. And you suspect a case when a, when a patient shows up with the symptoms that I described. Just suspect. And these cards that the state of California gives are very simple little index cards that you just fill out, the date, the time, what the, what the um, symptoms were. And the State Department, Cal OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Association, uh, Administration, comes and does investigation to see if indeed it is a pesticide poisoning. Clinical providers didn't know that. So this conference, we brought in people who were the experts about pesticide poisoning. We brought in the Cal OSHA people. We brought in. Um, a lot of folks that talked about the medical manifestations, the diagnosis, everything. Anyway, they got medical units, the clinicians, the nurse practitioners, the physician's assistants. We did that for the whole, I mean, there was like probably 500 people that came to that. We also did a conference for farm owners because they were non-compliant. They were supposed to provide protective clothing for the farm workers, meaning gloves, hats, uh, long sleeves, boots without holes. Otherwise, they were not, they were, they were subjected to a major fine. So what got them there is that they don't want to pay the fine. So they came to the conference. And then the other, the other conference we did was for the actual farm workers themselves. Because the farm workers were not aware of what was the extreme danger with working with these harsh chemicals and pesticides. Now, even though the majority of the farm workers that I worked with were undocumented, they still have rights to a safe work environment, as safe as possible, even though farm work is considered one of the most hazardous jobs in, in America. They are still entitled to protective wear. They're still entitled to know, to not go into a field after a certain time. So they didn't know that. And they're too fearful of being deported and losing their job than, you know, to complain. We also worked with the families of the farm workers, so people would know that when you come home, how you have to take your clothes off before you go in the house. You don't want to cross-contaminate. You don't want to put your clothes in the same hamper. 
the, the person who does the laundry cannot wash them together. If a woman is pregnant, she's exposed to even the smallest amount of pesticide could cause severe neurological damage to her unborn child. So there's a lot of things that we did. This took place over the period of about two and a half years. And you can bet that, yeah, my, my doctor that I worked with, he did not like me too much. The farm owners hated me. They would see me get on to the grounds to go to where the, I would, because I wanted to go see where the men were. I wanted to go see where the, um, the protective clothing was. They did not like me. So in my public health hat, you're not necessarily the most favored person, but I was there advocating on behalf of the farm workers. I never, I never wanted to see that many men come into a clinic again. I wanted to see them knowing their rights and knowing that they had rights to a safe workplace. So that was, that was public health. That was public health different because I wasn't happy and satisfied as the nurse only seeing them when they were sick and especially seeing them with this crazy diagnosis and outrageous uh, prescription for Valium. So you guys have probably already heard this saying, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This was really true in this case. So if we can prevent what are the results of pesticide poisoning, it's going to save so much more money than the cure. And that's exactly what public health works on, is prevention. So I like to frame it in this way, is that public health is proactive to keep populations healthy, and it recognizes the community, the entire community, as the patient. Whereas clinical medicine, the approach is individual, and it's one patient at a time, and the focus is not on health care, but on sick care. And that certainly was my experience as a nurse. It was really the sick care. And I appreciate people who take care of us when we're sick. I need that. Our families need that. But I wanted to work on the health prevention part. And that's what really switched it for me, that I knew this was my passion that I wanted to focus my career on for the rest of my life. So there's a classic story in public health, upstream, downstream story. And this will also reinforce what I was just saying. So the way the story works is this way. Downstream, there was a group of people that were having a picnic on the bank next to this beautiful river. And they're going about their lovely day, they're eating their food, and all of a sudden they hear a lot of screams and cries for help, and they can hear the water being splashing and thrashing, and a couple people go to the river and they look and they see that there's people that are obviously in distress, appears to be that they're drowning and they're going under the water. So they start pulling out the bodies and they yell for their friends who are still having the picnic to say, come help, come help, we gotta save these people. So they go in the river and they're, trying, they're pulling them out, they're pulling them out, and some of the people have the people on the bank and they're giving them mouth to mouth resuscitation, they're giving them CPR, and there's still people going past and they cannot get enough people. They don't have enough people to rescue. So clearly people are going down the river and they're drowning now. Few of them who were doing this decide to go upstream to, and they ask, what's going on upstream? Why are these people in the river? Why are they drowning? They go way upstream to see that, wow, look, there's no barricade, there's no gate, there's no sign. There's, there's a lot of issues. The bank is very soft. People are falling in. And they even think even further than that of, well, what if we could put, provide swimming lessons for people? You know, thinking way upstream. So which is cheaper, upstream, prevention, or now working downstream where people here, some of them are going to be on life support, some of them are going to have permanent damage, and some of them clearly didn't even make it. So which is more costly? It's, it's downstream, right? So as public health, what we try to do is work as upstream as possible, as much as possible. But let's be clear, we need people to work all along the river, all the time. It's just a matter of how far up do you want to be. If you want to work way upriver, then you want to work on policy. You want to work to make sure that as much as possible policies are in place for people to have healthy environments. You can work primary prevention. You can work secondary prevention. It just depends on where. what's the impact that you want to have. My work with farm workers, I was downstream as the nurse. I went upstream. And I want to prevent those pesticide poisoning cases from the first place. So I went upstream. So, but we need both. We want, to prevent, we want to prevent people from continuing to have the same issues and problems ongoing. So think about public health, about pr protection. We talk about protection, those seat belts, we talk about helmets. 
We talk about the protection of the foods, prevention, the prevention of, of problems. We just mentioned that about pesticide poisoning and the promotion of healthy environment, healthy lifestyle. So we want to do all three of these. That is what public health is about. Okay, so here's the point in, in my talk where I ask you, what is the number that may determine how healthy you are and how long you will live? Anybody have a guess? You can just yell it out. What is the number? Who said it? You have to say it louder. What is it? No. Very close. Zip code. Zip code. Were you going to say that? OK. Your zip code. So your address is what determines that. Now, sometimes people are really surprised by that. And a lot of times people are like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. Because we know you're as healthy as you are by your environments in which you live. That's as healthy as we know. We can tell how long you're going to live, what the top um, causes of death are, infant mortality, morbidity st statistics by looking up your zip code. Any state department, city health department, county health department can do this. It's very easy to do. It depends on where you live. But when we think about numbers, normally, or usually, we think about your, your blood pressure reading, your, maybe your body mass index at BMI, maybe it's your cholesterol, but, it's, but your address is going to be the most telling of your health. So right now, and this has been going on for a while with Kaiser Permanente, they have this really amazing marketing campaign about how you can thrive. You can thrive. They want you to thrive. You want to live well, stay, stay healthy, and thrive. So right now, there's open enrollment. There's a lot of commercials out about this. And they show these great ads that make you feel good, right? They feel, oh, you just want to go running now. You see this? You want to go ride a bike with the balloons. I love that one. The guy riding, and he has these balloons. He's so happy. Flowers are sticking out of the basket. So it's great, right? You want to be able to do that. Now, if you live in a community like Beverly Hills, 90210, this might be your house. This might be your small little abode. And you're just, OK, that's your home. This is, you know, whatever. It's OK. But when you want to go shopping to go buy your food, this could be your closest market that you have to your home. And you have access to these are not only just fresh fruits, but they're organic and they're sustainable. And then you maybe decide you want to barbecue some salmon. It's just not farm salmon. This is wild Alaskan salmon, the best. So you have the best of the best of the best if you live in that area code or your zip code. Oh, yeah, and then when you come home and you want to go running like that first slide, it's going to be a nice, even sidewalk. Pretty, looks pretty well manicured, pretty well taken care of. And there's a pretty good chance that there's lights. So at night, you can, you can run and not worry that's going to be dark and unsafe. It's a pretty safe neighborhood. A lot of your neighbors are going to be running with their golden retrievers here. <laughs> now, if your zip code is 90305, and you're in Los, South Los Angeles, this might be a home that is, is your house, OK? This is very typical for that neighborhood. There is a sidewalk, but sometimes there are no sidewalks. And we know that when there's no sidewalks, people are less inclined to go walking and or jogging and also not feel safe. It's not the safest community, not a lot of street lights, not a lot of infrastructure in, in the environment to help for a healthy lifestyle. Also, when you're, if you have a child, your, your child wants to go outside and play or, or go down the street and they say, Mom, I'm hungry, I need something, this might be the closest store that they have. This is a liquor store that I don't know about you, but pretty much I don't think they're going to have those organic melons in there or that wild Alaskan salmon. Probably get some chips, six-pack, right, a few things like that. But this might be the closest store to this family. This might be the, and it often is the closest store. So there's things called, um, communities called food deserts, where there's lack of access to a, a grocery store that they can buy fruits and vegetables and fresh foods. The kids might have to play in something like this, a, a dumpster where they did a makeshift slide. And, and who knows what's in that dumpster, but it's probably not very safe. So then public health asks, 
how can you thrive? How can you live well? And how can you stay healthy and thrive if your zip code is not 90210? You see the difference? How? So our traditional medical model puts the emphasis on the individual. We just have to make the choices to eat our vegetables and exercise. Individually, you just do it. Let me give you the information and you just make those changes. The public health model works with communities to have access to affordable, healthy, fresh food. So this was a community that this was an open lot, had nothing in it. But the community worked with public health to organize farmers markets. So now the community has access to healthier and fresher foods, not that liquor store. So this is what public health does. Doesn't put the onus on the individual, but it says how can we make our communities healthier? Now here's a great example that I like to talk about, which is um, looking at how policies, policies and systems, system practices increase access to parks. So in 2006, this was in Los Angeles, and if anybody's from Los Angeles, you might know about this park. This is near downtown Los Angeles. This used to be nothing. This used to be, there was a lot here. There was um, just a lot of like broken glass. There was a lot of drug dealing that went on there and the, the neighbors complained because it was noisy. Often a lot of people met there. They were not doing good things. People felt fearful. They wouldn't go out at night. They, did not, they avoided the area. But with the city project of California, they worked with the neighborhoods. They organized this park to put this major park there and now it, it's a huge soccer field with lights kids go play there after school families go there they utilize it and so we know in public health that people live healthier when they have access to outside recreational parks so there's a lot of good example it's not all bad news this is what public health is doing through advocacy and community organizing is helping communities to live healthier so those zip codes don't have to have those negative statistics, that they can actually turn those around. All of this is changeable. We just need people like you to be in the field to make those changes. Public health also knows that health inequities are neither natural nor inevitable. So when you hear the words health disparities or health inequities, and that meaning that people of color primarily or poor um, income, lower income community members have higher disproportionate burden of illness and disease, that doesn't mean we have to accept it. And it doesn't mean it's just because it's, it, it's meant to be. It's because of institutionalized and structural discrimination and past practices of injustice that we as a society have placed upon those communities that have created these inequities and health disparities. So they're not natural, they're not inevitable. We can change that. And that's what public health is doing. And public health addresses the deeper root causes of health inequities by looking what's underneath. Why do we have these poor health outcomes? Well, because public health understands that poverty and unemployment are the major social determinants of health. So poverty in public health is considered one of the number one public health issues. And I talked a little while ago in another workshop that in California, through the California Endowment, there's a major initiative that's been going on for the past year and a half focusing on boys and men of color in California because of a crisis that looks at boys and men of color are not graduating from high school. They're dropping out at horrific high rates. They end up in horrifically high rates in incarceration. Now when we look at economic workforce needs in California, we need people to be sustaining the workforce to support the people who are, who are older, to support the people who are younger. But how can we do this if our boys and men of color are not graduating? So, so right now, there's been hearings throughout the state of California working on making sure, helping to ensure that young boys and men of color are attaining educational levels to go into a vocational training and or college to be self-sufficient, to support their families, to uh, support society, and by doing that, they're going to have better health outcomes. So unemployment, education are all major determinants of health. Does that make sense to you guys? You get that? If you want to know more about that, you can go to the California Endowment Foundation. There's a lot of information that's going on about that, but that is what really is making a difference. So we look at the deeper root causes of what's going on. 
And Martin Luther King Jr. said this in the 1960s, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So he said that so long ago, but it's so relevant today. And luckily, we're at a time where the Affordable Health Care Act is being started. So instead of health care being for a privileged few, it's now being seen as a right, that we have a right to health care. And with our current administration, Barack Obama, who I find him to be a very public health oriented president, is ensuring that everybody, all of us, all of us humans, with no judgment, have a right to basic health care. So little by little, we're making those changes. And that is important given the profound demographic shifts that we're seeing in our country, in the state of California, in the world. This is why we are talking about understanding the diversity, the needs that we have in public health. And we have now the challenge to dig deeper, not only on diversity, but on equity. So we talk a lot about equity and health equity. Now what this slide is showing, the red and the orange, is showing the counties that have people of color, the majority of people of color. And it's gonna change in increments of 10 years. So you'll see now that now here we are at 2000, there's more where it's the more, over 40% are populations of color, communities of color. And it's growing each year by increments by this slide. So right now in several cities of Metro America, we're seeing the majority of populations of color, but it's spreading throughout the whole United States. And so by the year of 2040, it will be a majority of color in, in our country. So what, the, what this means for you all is that you will all need to have training to be effective as intercultural public health practitioners. You need to be at the table, you need to bring that diversity to be at the table to help create the solutions for our, for our world. So we're at a profound demographic shift right now and it's very important that in public health we talk about this, it's no longer okay just to be, oh yeah, we have diversity, how nice. But it's a major, it's a major, um, it's not an issue, but it's a major facet of the work that we do that we're addressing head on. And if you go to a school of public health and they're not talking about it in that front way and you need to be the critical public health practitioner that you want to be, then you might want to think about a different school because that's who you need to be working. And even if you are an MD, MPH, that's exactly the kind of training you're going to need. One of the reasons why I fell in love with public health so much is that it is about social justice. It is about righting those wrongs. And so that example I shared with you about the farm workers, I knew how wrong that was. And I know I'm not going to be popular. I know I'm not going to be getting those handshakes and those smiles. But you know what? You're in it because you care. And you need to be that voice for those that have no, no voice. Farm workers, undocumented, fearful. They don't want to raise a fuss. They want those jobs. They'll work in those hard harsh conditions, but public health, you work to help them to have a better life. So if you really care and you want to make a difference, then you will understand that social justice is one of the fundamental values of public health. Diversity in public health, this is where you guys come into the picture. We need that diverse workforce. We, that's why my school hired a director of diversity because they know this isn't a nice to, oh yeah, it's so nice, let's have diversity, oh, it's so special. They know this is an imperative. If we really are going to have a workforce of public health practitioners, they need to be representatives of all the communities that are out there. So I have, I have a, a designated job that is about doing this. Now, where do public health professionals work? Well, you work a lot of places. City and county health departments, state health departments. I worked for the state health department. Um, I worked at hospitals, I worked at nonprofit agencies, I now work at a university. The only place I haven't worked is a biotech firm. I probably won't do that, but you can work at a lot of different places, and as I said, the job security is excellent. We do a job, uh, a survey of our graduates within three months of them graduating, and our, our class that just graduated in May, the average salary is 83700 Most people don't go to public health because they want to make the big bucks. But I share this because I want you to know that you'll be just fine. You'll be able to support yourself. You'll be able to support your family. And this is, your, this is the starting salary. So within a short period of time, people will definitely climb up the, economic, uh, the income ladder. 
But again, that's not the primary reason why people go into public health, but you will be just fine. Okay, I'm shifting now into the specific programs at UC Berkeley. So when you apply, you have to pick an area of concentration. These are two-year programs, four semesters long. So you can pick one of these, environmental health, epidemiology, biostatistics, health and social behavior, which was my program, health policy and management, infectious diseases and vaccinology, maternal child health, and public health nutrition. So you have to pick one of them. But what if you're stuck like I was and you really wanted to get into policy, but you definitely wanted to do health and social behavior, which is more like health education. What I did was I picked health and social behavior, but I took a lot of policy classes as my electives. So that way I could get both. My, my interest was in immigration. So I took, a lot, I took immigration policy courses. So you can do that. You never feel like you're just stuck. Once you take your core courses, then you're free to move about the school. And you can even take courses at the law school, at the policy school. You're free to move about the entire campus to take your electives in anything that you want, which makes it really exciting. Now, how, what does it take to get to Berkeley? Well, you need a bachelor's degree, but in pretty much anything. The only time you need a science-oriented bachelor's is if you're going into a science area of concentration like infectious diseases or environmental health or epidemiology. But if you're not, like I was, then you don't need a science. So save yourself the heartache, unless you love, love, love science and get your 4.0 or better than a 3.8, don't take it. Because I see a lot of undergrads who come to me and they have a 2.6 or 2.5 because they've been pre-med and they haven't been doing well and they've struggled and they're very upset and they're depressed because they told their parents they're going to be pre-med so they better stick with it and their friends are pre-med, but they don't really like it. But then I see in their other coursework, women's studies, ethnic studies, history, political science, they're getting A's and they love those courses. That's their major. That's the major they should have had. And that's who we admit, people with political science and history and psychology and sociology. The most important thing, this is the most important message, is have a GPA that will open doors to not only Berkeley, but to Harvard and Columbia and all the top schools. Because then you'll be at the position of choosing. But if you have a GPA that's below 3.0, then your options are going to be very, very narrow. So major in what you love and do well in it. You also need to have um, the GRE and score at least 50th percentile. But I'll tell you this, we don't just look at your scores at Berkeley, we do a, what's called a holistic review. So we look at the whole picture, we look at your background, we look at research programs that you've been involved with, if you're a McNair scholar, if you've done uh, work, CDC uh, research work, if you've been part of the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, if you're first generation. We look at your background, we look to see did you support your family, were you working 20 hours a week, whatever it is, we look at the whole range of your application. Three outstanding letters, and I always say that because people will write really bad letters. And somebody has to write an excellent outstanding letter about you that sings your praises to the moon. And if they can't, then you walk on and you ask somebody else. We get too many really bad letters, and honestly, I've seen our faculty not admit somebody because they had a bad letter. And I, I think to myself, why did they ask this person to write them a letter? Obviously, they didn't even like them. See, I see that all the time. So that's why I always put the word outstanding. Your statement of purpose, why Berkeley, why now, why you, that's very clear. And that your personal history, this is the diversity part. Our school does an interview, but we want, an, we want a diverse class. We want a diverse, um, you know, incoming class every single year. But the only way for us to really know that is for you to tell us about who you are, your background, your journey, who it is, what, what's happened that make you who you are. So that's what we want because the diversity not only will be important for the work you're going to do when you graduate, but it deepens the learning for everybody in your class. If everybody there is very diverse, you're going to learn from each other and that makes your learning so much better. So it's extremely important. And the last thing that you can barely see on the slide is experience. So make every summer count, get involved in research, internships, volunteer. We like to see experience after a bachelor's degree, especially for health policy um, and management and also health social behavior. So health core, Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, and also jobs. There's a lot of jobs 
for our bachelors, people just stop, sometimes don't know it, but you get those jobs if you have volunteer experience first or these other um, part-time research jobs will lend to other jobs. You can also get a concurrent degree with an MPH, and this is becoming really popular as well. So you can get an MPH with a social welfare degree or public policy or city and regional planning, journalism or business. And so what this means is that in three years you would have two masters. And you don't have to know that from the beginning. You can just come in with, for the MPH, and then when you're there, as you consider, maybe you take a city and regional plan, a class. It's called Healthy Cities. That's an intro class. And you're like, wow, this stuff's awesome. I want to learn about infrastructure and land use and GIS mapping. Then you apply to get in. And you're already going to be very, very competitive because you're already a grad student. So it'll be more likely that you'll be accepted for the, following, the other program. So that's something to consider. And then we also have doctoral degrees. You can get one of two. One is an, as a PhD, which is a very research-oriented program for four to five years. Somebody who wants to do research, probably work in academia, teaching, and conducting their own research. Or the DRPH, a doctor in public health. This is for someone who really envisions himself being a leader, a practitioner, maybe in charge of a whole center or an, uh, an arm of the CDC or running the city and county health department. You, this is only three years, but you need to have two years post MPH experience for the DRPH. But both of those are, are very popular and generally get, get pretty well funded if you get admitted. Now, I only have about three minutes, so I'm going to just run through these. But medical school, we get a lot of medical school students. You can come in first two years or during medical school or after, and then that's just a one-year program. So if you're in medical school, only one year or right after, but very popular to do that. This is a very popular internship that I want to make sure everybody knows about, Health Careers Connection. The application for this will be out next month. The website is healthcareers.org, and the deadline would be early February. These are paid. They're all over California. There are also some in the East Coast. But graduate schools love to see this, and it will give you really good healthcare uh, career exposure. The other one is Project Imhotep, and I think that you were given small index cards about this. This is a project I work with with the CDC, and they start you off with two weeks in the CDC in public health training, and then you do research either at the CDC or other places, but they pay for everything, and there's really great um, experiences. They have the same program through Columbia University, Krager, Kennedy Krager through Johns Hopkins and University of Michigan. So just go to the CDC website and go CDC CUPS, C-U-P-S, and all of those other ones would come up. Right now, this fall, is the critical time when all these applications are up for research and internships, and they'll all be due in January or February. So already have a plan for what you're going to be doing next, next summer 2014. Always know that. Always make your summers count. If you want help in anything advising along the way, we have a whole Office of Diversity Services. We have current grad students, which are Graduate Recruitment Diversity Services. We have um, our Health Career Opportunities Program. And then I work with our Diversity Outreach Coordinator. So if you're not local to the Bay Area and can come in and meet, we do phone appointments. We do phone advising. You can email us, and we'll set it up. But you're free to come. We have an annual conference for prospective students every fall. You can just look at the website for that. And I'm going to leave with this final quote. And then I'll be done, but I'm happy to talk to anybody individually if you have questions. And also, I can give you my business card. But I think on any of these websites, you can get a hold of me. But our former Surgeon General said, "Healthcare matters to all of us some of the time, but public health matters to all of us all of the time. And with that, thank you guys so much, and I hope to see you. Thank you.